I, I don't, you know, I, I don't, uh, I don't, I'm not sure where, how we go about now really responding to the, the, the culture of hatred that has been created. Um, because although like, I know people who feel quite hopeful and who think that the, the tide is turning and, you know, that a lot of people are, are, are at last turning against feminism I, uh, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I think that if you wanted to uh, really harm society, you couldn't have done better than, than what feminism has done. And, and like it, the harm is so profound that it's, it's sometimes kind of overwhelming to think yeah. about it. You know, so many men have been alienated because their best impulses, their, their most benevolent, um, desires and ambitions have been uh, have been perverted and and you know they've been shamed for them as we said and on the other side I think women have been harmed by having the encouragement of women's worst worst <laughs> not best worst instincts and and impulses our our discontent our uh, vainglory, our narcissism, like all those I think are really exacerbated and affirmed by a feminist culture, even if it isn't, you know, called feminism, just the whole culture of you go girl, you're perfect, just the way you are. And don't let anybody ever tell you that you need to improve in any aspect of your life, because you're just great the way you are. Um, you know, and that idea that anytime a woman is criticized for anything that that's in itself, sexist in some way and she's perfectly justified in not only ignoring it but maybe even amplifying whatever the thing was that was being criticized you know campaigns like ban bossy as if it's a good thing if people if women are bossy because anything that women do even if it's violent and destructive and mean-spirited is somehow empowering like all of that i think is you know, and just the refusal to admit that that there could be anything in women that would need to be curbed or channeled in you know in a in a productive rather than a destructive direction. So all of that, I think, has been really harmful for women, and and it has created such a tremendous divide between men and women that uh, yeah, it's just it's it's quite dispiriting at times, but. Uh, so I guess, you know, the one thing I feel like I can contribute really is to, because I spent so many years reading all of these theorists and, and uh, I, I do feel I, I know them in a way that very few even feminists do. And the, the feminists who do know them and what they stand for aren't telling. And yeah. so I feel like I'm one of the few who, who actually knows what they said, right? back in 1792 and I'm, I'm putting it into a book and, and I hope that will encourage people. Um, because I, I know that, you know, whenever someone says, oh, I think we have to get away from this feminist idea, then someone will always come back and say, so you're saying that you're an, you know, you're saying you're opposed to women's rights. You're saying you don't care if women are harmed and all that kind of thing. And, and so what I want to show is that there, there never was a benign feminism that was ever not really, really angry and ever not interested in destroying the social order in order to remake it in a, in a utopian guise. It was always anti-family and it made that quite clear. Even like Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who was the major leader of the American women's movement from the mid 19th century on, she has, she has um, lectures that she gave at, at private venues where she called for um, basically no fault divorce. You know, she felt that um, marital unions should be able to be dissolved at will and that that would make everybody so much happier. She never mm -hmm. really seemed to think about what, what would be the fate of children uh, who would have their families broken up by this dissolution. Uh, you know, that was as early as the 1870s. There were free love advocates on the radical wing of the feminist movement from the mid 19th century. So all of these ideas about destroying the family, seeing the family as the site of women's oppression, um, 
representations of male sexuality as fundamentally, they didn't use the word toxic, but that's essentially what they were saying. That was there in very early days of the movement too. So all the elements that we see now were already there. So there was never a time when it was about equality and nobody could ever really say what equality was anyway, because as we know, it just, there is no such thing. Men and women are not equal in that sense. Of course, they're of equal value. But, uh, you know, what, is, what does it mean to say that they're equal? And, and this was the, there's a wonderful, uh, well, an interesting anyway, uh, uh, philosopher, barrister, um, and journalist named Ernest Belfort Bax, who wrote a couple of books in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. One was called The Fraud of Feminism. Mm. And that was one of the things he pointed out that it was feminism was always fundamentally incoherent. And yet that was its strength. <laughs> and, and what he meant by that was that on the one hand, feminists would always say women are perfectly as capable as men of doing you know, anything at all. And so any uh, area of society where women aren't equally represented, that was evidence of discrimination. We still hear that today, right? If yes. you look at STEM fields and there's still one, you know, where men <laughs> uh, outnumber women, that must be because of discrimination, not because of different abilities or different interests or different inclinations. Right. So they, that was always the argument. But then on the other side, the argument was women are different from men. Women need special protections. Women are morally superior to men. They're less capable of violence. They have special mothering abilities and responsibilities. And so we need to always be concerned, you know, whenever they express a concern or a fear or a dissatisfaction, we need to make sure that we change policies or laws in order to to you know, secure their their comfort and their well being. So always those two things. He called one sentimental feminism, the one about how women are different and need special treatment, and the other was political feminism, how women are actually just as good as men and need, you know need all these 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 equal rights. And yeah, it's still like that today. And um, and it just it seems to have lost none of its power. Uh, and yet, as a political movement, it's very, very destructive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, the combination, uh, that's a great distinction, sentimental versus political feminism. It's sort of a one-two punch. You know, you have the appeal to emotion on one side, and then you have that seems to legitimize the rage that then exacts yes. itself as vengeance in the political, cultural, and even, you know, and even personal social sphere. Like these yeah. ideas... You know, these intellectual ideas are not consequence free. They don't live in a bubble. They show up in people's homes and their families yeah. and their relationships. And that's where the sharp point gets driven into men. It's not yeah. necessarily just in Captain Marvel or whatever in a Marvel TV show. It's like it shows up in men's marriages. It shows up yeah. the way that women treat their their young sons. And I, I don't think it's impossible to draw a straight line from kill all men to castrate my son. Like mm -hmm. I don't, I don't, and the, the transgender phenomenon is primarily, yes. you know, through children is boys transitioning to girls. And mm -hmm. I think that those, I think those two things are very connected. Well, when you read, uh, there are all sorts of feminist treatises on the internet or just, you know, like op-eds and newspapers and that sort of thing by feminist mothers talking about their fears that their son is going to turn out to be a rapist, yep. their determination that they're going to you know, drill into their son from the time he's two or three years old, that he's not to look at girls, that yep. he's, you know, not to do this, that he can harm girls just by looking at them, you know, all that stuff. Like, wow. I mean, it, it's horrifying to think of what kind of a awful guilt trip these mothers are determined to lay on their sons. And yes, their revulsion at the very idea of masculinity. Well, it wouldn't be surprising then if that little boy is going to say, yeah, well, I want to be a girl. And then the mother who thinks that masculinity is evil is going to encourage it for sure. So yeah, it's, it does have these massive personal consequences. Mm -hmm. and, and disrupting marriages as well. Yeah. Yeah. So um, just a, do you have time for another question or two?